Hello and welcome to Approaches Lesson 1. The Approaches chapter in psychology concerns itself with different ways of explaining behaviour. And there are a lot of different disciplines within psychology that attempt to explain why we do what we do. Some of these are still in use and others not so much. And over the next seven lessons or so, we are going to be looking at each one of these approaches and the pros and cons and how they explain behavior and so on. Now, the idea of psychology as a distinct brand of study is generally dated at around 1880. And we'll have a little look at what happened in 1880 to kind of mark that turning point. However, that being said, the original roots of psychology date much further back to the times of philosophers such as René Descartes and also John Locke. There's even reports of what I suppose could be classed as psychological intervention as far back as 6000 BC, which again we'll have a quick look at um, in a sec. In this video, we are going to have a look at how psychology has evolved over time. We're going to describe the work and evaluate the work of the first ever experimental psychologist, Wilhelm Wundt, and then we are also going to chart the emergence of psychology as a scientific discipline. So just to start off with, dealing with mental health issues and psychological illness dates back to around 6500 BC, where mental health issues, although to be fair they weren't called that back then, they were dealt with through things like trepanning. Which is exactly what the picture shows. People used to drill holes in other people's heads to release evil spirits. Not a practice that we still use today, but it just shows us that an awareness of this kind of stuff dates back very, very far. Um, the first big change came in 1880 with this guy, Wilhelm Wundt, who opened the first experimental lab for psychology, and it's at this point when psychology emerges as a distinct discipline. The majority of the video is going to look at his work. Then in the early 1900s, you have the psychodynamic approach and the work of Sigmund Freud, who emphasizes the influence of the unconscious mind on behavior. This is followed by the work of behaviorists such as B.F. Skinner and John Watson and their approach that dominated psychology for the first half of the 21st century. In the 1950s, the humanistic approach was developed, which actively rejected the behaviorist approach and the psychodynamic approach and emphasized the importance of free will and self-determination. Then in the second half of the 20th century, with technological advances such as the computer and brain scanning techniques and that kind of thing, approaches like the cognitive approach and the biological approach started to emerge, which focused on the impact of mental processes and biological processes on behavior. This has obviously been a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, but it just kind of shows what type of journey psychology has actually been on to get to where it is today. And a lot of these approaches we're going to be looking over um, during this chapter, with the exception of trepanning, that's not on the syllabus. But getting to know these approaches and actually understanding that a lot of these approaches still exist is important just to kind of understand why psychology is the way that it is, but it also kind of comes up in some research methods topics as well. So let's make a start with Wilhelm Wundt, who opened the first ever lab dedicated entirely to psychological inquiry. He's the first person to be known as a psychologist, and he opened his lab in 1879 in Leipzig in Germany. Now, his work is significant because it marks the beginning of scientific psychology, which meant that the subject was starting to split from its philosophical roots. Now, Wundt's aim was to analyse the nature of human consciousness, and that represented the first systematic attempt to study the mind under controlled conditions. And we'll have a little look at what he did on the next slide. And Wilhelm Wundt pioneered a method which became known as introspection. Again, a, a method that isn't widely used these days, but it is still one that exists, and there are still psychologists out there that use it. As I just said, Wundt's work represents the first systematic and experimental attempt to study human behavior. And his main objective was to try and develop theories about mental processes like language and perception. Now, his method, 
introspection involves him and his co-workers recording their experiences in reaction to various stimuli that they were presented with, such as different sounds or different objects. They divided their observations into three categories, thoughts, images, and sensations. And then they recorded their thoughts, images, and sensations in reaction to stimuli such as a ticking metronome. And just to be clear, when I say images, I mean images in their mind. So things that they think about in reaction to something like a ticking metronome. The stimuli were always presented in the same order, and all of the participants received the same instructions. Okay, and then just as a final note on this slide, this process of isolating the structure of consciousness, which is kind of what they were trying to do, became known as structuralism. So that is the work of Wilhelm Wundt. That is kind of all you need to know. Um, you know, questions in the exam can come up and they can ask you about introspection. They can ask you what is meant by intros introspection or describe the work of Wilhelm Wundt, something along those lines. It's come up as a four marker. It's also come up as a six marker. Um, so just kind of knowing what came up on the last two slides um, will help you get through that type of question. Now, the other thing that you need to know about for the spec is the emergence of psychology as a science. As I said earlier, the work of Wilhelm Wundt and his colleagues mark the beginning of scientific psychology. However, it doesn't take a genius to realise that by today's standards, his work wasn't particularly scientific. However, it did then result in psychology being pushed into increasingly scientific realms. And this next little bit is just to show you what happened to make psychology the science that it is today. So by the beginning of the 20th century, the value of introspection was being questioned by many, most specifically by behaviorists such as John Watson. The problem was that introspection produced very, very subjective data. So it's quite difficult to establish general principles of behavior, something that a science actually attempt to do, try to establish general principles. And so these problems with introspection led to the birth of behaviorism, an approach that believes a truly scientific psychology should only study things that can be observed objectively and measured. And therefore, behaviorism only focuses on behaviors that can be seen and studies these behaviors using carefully controlled experiments. The behaviorist approach is an approach that went on to dominate psychology for the next 50 years or so, and it's still one that is massively influential today. In the 1950s, then, the digital revolution gave a new generation of psychologists a metaphor for studying the mind, because cognitive psychologists then started comparing the mind to a computer, and they came up with models like the multi-store model or the working memory model and they tested their predictions about memory and attention and perception and language using experiments, and the cognitive approach then continued to ensure that the study of the mind was legitimate and highly scientific, because just like the behaviorists, they used carefully controlled lab studies. Obviously, the difference here between the cognitive approach and the behaviorist approach is that the cognitive approach was studying things that couldn't necessarily be seen, but they were still using scientific methods and scientific experiments to do that. And then, just finally, in more recent times, the biological approach has taken psychology to new levels, scientifically speaking, because research within that area takes advantage of technological advances to investigate processes as they happen. So for example, they use sophisticated scanning techniques like fMRIs and EEGs to study live activity in the brain. They also take advantage of new methods like genetic testing to help us better understand the link between genes and behavior. Again, ensuring that highly scientific standards are maintained in the discipline in order to establish some form of cause and effect. Okay, so starting with Wundt, the 
The discipline of psychology has become more and more scientific, driven not only by ideas of what psychology as a science should look like, but also driven by technological advances that makes that more easy to achieve. So again, if you get a question on this, it could be a four marker or a six marker, and the question will be something along the lines of, describe the emergence of psychology as a science. You start with the behaviorists at the point where introspection is being questioned, and you explain why it's being questioned, and then you move on from there. Okay? Right, so before we finish, there are a couple of very brief evaluation points for both the work of Wundt and introspection, but also for the emergence of psychology as a science, just in case any of these ever come up as an outline and evaluate question. So let's start with the work of Wundt and introspection. So the strength of this particular bit is that Wundt's methods were very systematic and they were well controlled. Okay, they had a controlled environment, they were able to control extraneous variables, they had standardized procedures, and so you can say that this really was a forerunner to later scientific approaches like the behaviorist approach. They didn't get everything right, and there was, you know, a lot of stuff that they needed to change, but for a start, it wasn't bad in terms of the control that they had and the standardized procedures that they used. That being said, a lot of other elements would be considered unscientific. For example, self-reporting mental processes is a little bit tricky because it becomes very, very subjective. Some of the participants could have had thoughts that they didn't want to share, and so they could just hide those thoughts and not report them. That means that it's quite difficult to establish meaningful laws of behavior, which is one of the aims of scientific study. Okay, so that means that some of Wundt's early efforts to study the mind are flawed and they wouldn't necessarily meet the criteria of scientific inquiry by today's standards. Okay, so moving on to evaluating the emergence of psychology as a science. The first point is that modern psychology can claim to be scientific, and that is obviously a strength. It has the same aims as the natural sciences, which is to describe understand, predict, and control behavior, and approaches like the cognitive approach or behaviorism and also the biological approach all rely on the use of scientific methods, like lab studies, for example, to investigate theories in a controlled and unbiased way. So that suggests that throughout the 20th century and beyond, psychology has established itself as a scientific discipline, which is obviously a strength. However, that being said, not all approaches in psychology use scientific methods. For example, the humanistic approach actively rejects scientific methods because it's more interested in studying and understanding the individual experience and subjective experiences of people. So that obviously goes against scientific values or scientific criteria. You've also got the psychodynamic approach, which uses case studies, and case studies are very often unrepresentative of the majority because they're only studying one or two unique people. Finally, the subject of study. So the fact that we are studying humans is problematic because humans are active within the research and they respond to situations in the research. So they can be affected by demand characteristics, let's say. They can be affected by social desirability biases. They can be affected by investigator effects. All of these things means that studying human thoughts and human experiences in a scientific way might not necessarily always be possible in the way that we want to do it, as in, in a scientific way. Okay, so that is a limitation of psychology as a science. Okay, so those are your two kind of evaluation points that you need for that. Um, it's most likely to come up as an eight marker, but just be prepared in case it does come up as a 16 marker. Right, so just to finish, some of the exam questions that have come up already, I kind of alluded to them before, but this is kind of what's been on papers so far. You've got what's meant by introspection. Again, it can come up as a three marker, as a four marker. It's unlikely to come up as a six marker because there isn't that much to say, but again, anything's possible. 
um, describe the role of Wundt in the development of psychology. So that's a sneaky way of asking what did Wundt actually do? Um, and then describe the emergence of psychology as a science. Again, those second two could come up as a four marker or as a six marker. They're unlikely to come up as a three marker because there is quite a lot to say, but again, they could test your ability to condense your work and they could give it to you as a, as a three marker as well. So again, just be prepared for anything. Um, any variation of those questions could come up. So anything that you can think of for yourself, you know, it's not going to be a bad question. So instead of describe Wundt's role in the development of psychology, you could change that to outline the work of Wilhelm Wundt, you know, something like that, that would just work as well. And then, of course, you could also get the essay, outline and evaluate the work of Wilhelm Wundt, outline and evaluate the emergence of psychology as a science. Okay. Right, and that is the end of the video. So I hope that the first lesson in approaches has all made sense and I hope it's been useful. Please ask any questions that you need to, just pop them in the comment section below and as always, I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening and I will see you in the next one.